Many years ago, walnut trees like this welcomed the first explorers to our Grosse Point shores. Today, this 600-year-old tree at the Leonard Jack Estate reminds us of the early pioneers, their courage, their determination. Hello, I'm Joe Weaver. I've lived in Grosse Point for over 20 years. The story of how this lakeside community evolved from an uninhabited wilderness to a thriving 19th century farming village and summer resort will always intrigue me. It was just a mere 400 years ago when Native American Indians hunted on this land. My ancestors were Algonquin hunters and traders. Our history and our beliefs are preserved by celebrated storytellers. One of my favorite legends begins. Until the 19th century, Rose Point had such a tree. It was called the Treaty Pine. The tree became a symbolic reminder of the Indians who roamed the woods and marshes, now called Gross Point. In the mid 17th century, this pristine shoreline was claimed for France by explorers such as Robert Cavalier Sir de La Salle. Instead of traveling traditional northern river routes from French Canada to the western frontier, La Salle chose to explore the lower Great Lakes. On August 12, 1679, La Salle sailed his ship, the Griffin, into a small boot-shaped lake bordering land eventually called Gross Point. Indians had named the lake Atsakita, a variation of the Huron word for foot. La Salle's chaplain, Father Louis Hennepin, noted that August 12th was the feast day of St. Clair of Assisi and renamed the waters Lake St. Clair after the 13th century Italian nun. Hennepin wrote of his experience. This beautiful strait is fine open country. Many kinds of game are very plentiful, especially stags, hinds, wild turkeys, and bears. The rest of the land is covered with forests full of such fruit trees as walnut, chestnut, plum, pear, and apple. Among those who followed La Salle to Lake St. Clair were Quebec's voyagers. These unruly adventurers in jaunty torques and bright sashes paddled the canoes of merchant traders licensed by King Louis XIV of France. Initially, the voyagers rarely used La Salle Strait, but by the mid-18th century, their convoys regularly crossed Lake St. Clair, filled with European goods that were traded for Indian beaver pelts. In France, the pelts were made into stylish hats worn by King Louis and his courtiers. By 1701, Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac had royal permission to establish a fur trading settlement on the river south of Lake St. Clair. Once settled, he invited friendly Indian tribes such as the Huron, Chippewa, and Ottawa to camp nearby. The colony was designed to be a bulwark against the British fur traders from the east. Cadillac called his new post Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit, or Fort Pontchartrain of the Strait. Gross Point was first mentioned in an official report detailing the Fox Indian Massacre of 1712. The document described how Fox and Mascotan Indians had descended on Fort Pontchartrain when its Indian allies were away. The Indians quickly surrounded the stockade, causing a major disruption to the fort's routine. After 19 tense days, the intruders withdrew to the junction of the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair with the French fort dwellers and their Indian allies in pursuit. The ensuing battle nearly destroyed all the Fox warriors. And only four days later, the French claimed victory. Gross Point derives its name from the site of the Fox Massacre. For many years after the conflict, this uninhabited point and its surrounding Grand Marais were rarely visited except by occasional Indian hunters 
or illegal French trappers. It was the mid 18th century when habitant farmers, lured by subsidies from King Louis XV, ventured away from the fort's security to settle along the lake. Families such as the Trombleys, Rivards, and Renaults soon became neighbors of Michigan's first German settlers, the Yaks. It is known that the couple, while living in Ohio, was attacked and captured by Ottawa Indians. They were separated and by chance reunited at Fort Pontchartrain before joining Gross Point's earliest pioneers. This vanguard group, whether French or German, built homesteads near the water, cleared the woods, and soon harvested their first corn and wheat. Near their cabins, they planted apple and pear orchards. Tradition states that Gross Point's pear trees were imported from France. But it's interesting to note that as early as 1679, Father Hennepin saw pear trees growing along the Gross Point shore. Behind the orchards, habitat properties extended deep into the forest. These long, narrow plots, later called ribbon farms, gave each farmer ready access to Lake St. Clair and close proximity to friendly neighbors. Most habitants were gregarious and fun-loving. The men enjoyed racing their ponies along the lake shore. Neighbors often gathered for conversation and storytelling. Habitant stories were always exciting. Legends often mixed religion with superstition. Monsieur LaForest will tell us a typical story recalled from those early days in Gross Point. A Luton, a Scheitfell ghoul, was discovered taking a farmer's racing pony for midnight rides. <laughs> One night, as the pony and its scary rider were passing beneath the farmer's window, <laughs> he threw holy water onto them. Well, the pony and its rider bolted and disappeared into the lake. Well, ever since then, farmers have been branding their ponies with protective crosses. Fortunately, the habitants never let superstitions inhibit their natural entrepreneurial spirit. Jean Leduc owned a wind-powered gristmill built on the edge of the Grand Marais. And by 1756, farmers from both sides of Lake St. Clair brought their grain to the site they christened Windmill Point. Habitant women were often left tending the farms while the men hunted and traded for the French. But in 1760, the British won control of Detroit and all of French North America, and three years later, the British successfully repelled attempts by the French-supported Indian leader, Chief Pontiac, to reclaim Indian territory. Meanwhile, French Canadians, such as Nicolas Pananotra, took refuge in Gross Point. Eventually, escape from British influence became impossible, as British Americans, such as William Forsyth, purchased large tracts of land along the lake. About 1775, a Scottish Royal Navy officer, Commodore Alexander Grant, ordered his troops to build Gross Point's first mansion. Nicknamed Grant's Castle, it was nearly 160 feet long and easily housed a naval brigade, Indians such as Chief Tecumseh, and occasional Catholic missionaries. There was even room for Grant's French-Canadian wife and 11 daughters. Though Grant was a commander of the British Great Lakes Fleet, the American Revolutionary War seemed far away to those residing along Lake St. Clair. With the Peace Treaty of 1783, Gross Point, like most land east of the Mississippi, was ceded to the United States. Despite the Peace Treaty, British rule continued until the Jay Treaty gave America control in July 1796. During this time, Gross Point farmers continued to travel to Detroit to attend church, visit relatives, purchase supplies, and learn the latest news. When Detroit burned in 1805, sympathetic Gross Pointers sheltered the city's homeless. After the fire, land ownership as defined by the new federal law was often uncertain. Along Lake St. Clair, only farmers with clear property titles could obtain private claim or PC numbers and U.S. land patents. 
Ironically, the U.S. government had difficulty controlling the fur trade and became embroiled in the War of 1812. On August 1st, 1812, Detroit was again captured by the British. For the first time, Grosse Point residents were forced to endure the hardships of foreign occupation. Military scavengers and Indian raiders were a constant threat. The Americans did regain control of the region in September 1813, but a cholera epidemic hampered Detroit's recovery. To avoid infection, 43 United States soldiers were temporarily reassigned from their Detroit base to Grosse Point. Hoping for a better life, many Detroit residents soon followed the emigre soldiers. One newcomer, Pierre Provencal, relocated to Grosse Point in 1823. He built a house near today's Provencal Road and became a farmer. In 1831, he married Detroiter Euphemia St. Aubin. Together, they raised a daughter and several children, orphaned by cholera epidemics. The Provencals were members of Detroit's St. Anne Catholic Church. Occasionally, they invited the pastor, Father Gabriel Richard, to conduct mass in their parlor. In 1819, the first Great Lakes steamer, Walk in the Water, docked in Detroit. Six years later, the Erie Canal opening linked New York's Hudson River and the Great Lakes. Throngs of European immigrants and travelers journeyed to Michigan via this new route. Like others visiting Detroit in the mid-1830s, English writer Harriet Martineau traveled by carriage to Grosse Point. Her vivid impressions of the excursion were noted in her 1837 book, Society in America. The quiet Lake St. Clair. I have seen nothing in the United States like its level green banks. The groups of cattle, the distant steamboats, scarcely seeming to disturb the gray surface of still waters. This is the first of many scenes in Michigan which make me think of Holland. Detroiters truly enjoyed visiting Grosse Point's sweeping lakeshore vistas and rustic roadhouses. Henry Hudson, a well-known roustabout, and his lovely wife operated a popular lakeside tavern. My husband's antics made him something of a local legend. I remember the time he learned of his impending arrest for unpaid debts. He told me to stand in the window above the entrance to our roadhouse, and when the marshals came, I was to throw a bucket of cold water on their heads. Well, I did. And those marshals, soaked to the skin, left in a hurry <laughs> without Henry. Fortunately, most of Gross Point's new residents found more practical solutions to their problems. In 1825, Detroiter Louis Moran purchased the Alexander Grant Farm and divided the property between his youngest son, George, and his married daughter, Monique Campo. And during the mid-1830s, Michael Cadieu moved to Gross Point. He obtained his ribbon farm when he married the daughter of landowner Charles Gwen. On January 26, 1837, Grosse Point residents celebrated with compatriots statewide when Michigan became the Union's 26th state. Many new residents, like their predecessors, were Catholic. Their first church, a log cabin dedicated to St. Paul, was built about 1828 near Vernier Road. By the late 1840s, the growing congregation moved to the parish's present location. The new clapboard church quickly became the community center for the established French-Canadian families and recent Belgian immigrants. New arrivals such as the Bakemans, Brys, and Vanderbushes developed truck farms inland on the edge of the Black Marsh. As the population increased, so did the need for change. In 1848, the Michigan legislature approved the creation of Gross Point Township. Its boundaries stretch from Detroit's Waterworks Park to the Macomb County line, and from Lake St. Clair to beyond Gratiot Avenue. In 1851, a few Detroit businessmen joined together and built the Gross Point Plank Road. This toll highway followed along the Grand Marais shore to and from Detroit. It passed William Buck's new farmhouse, 
which was the first brick home built in Gross Point. Though the Gross Point Road was often flooded, a Detroit Free Press reporter wrote the following in 1859. One of the pleasantest drives out of the city to Gross Point is now in good repair, and the cherry trees, of which the point is prolific, are in bloom. Gross Point continued to be a favorite summer destination for Detroit families seeking respite from the city. Like Mrs. Fisher's hotel, the Weaver House was a popular lakeside stop for picnics or chicken, fish, and frog leg dinners. From the late 1850s through the 1890s, family-owned fisheries flourished along the Grand Marais and at the foot of Moran Road. Members of the Trombley, Kirby, and Michy families supplied many Detroit homes and restaurants with muscalunge and whitefish. During the Civil War years, the fishing industry, like other businesses, floundered. Many Gross Point men enlisted in the Union Army. Several, including Frederick Neff, joined the 24th Michigan Infantry, also known as the Iron Brigade. Wounded at Gettysburg, Neff described the war in one of many letters written to his wife. I am with the regiment again. I could not stay in the hospital. I could not bear the smell. Peter Rivard is very badly wounded. Joseph Rivard is slightly. The rest of us, Gross Point boys, are all right so far. Even before the Civil War, several prominent Detroit families enjoyed vacationing in Gross Point. The first summer resident was George Luthrop, a lawyer and eventual ambassador to Russia. In 1850, he purchased the eastern third of the Moran farm and built Summerside. Eventually, more Detroiters convinced farmers along the lake to sell their ancestral lands. In 1856, one of Lothrop's friends, Edmund Brush, acquired part of the Nicholas Benoit farm and built the Pines. Ten years later, Dudley Woodbridge, the son of Michigan's second governor, William Woodbridge, joined the summer colony as a gentleman farmer at Belle Mead. For the next three decades, ribbon farms continued to be converted into summer estates by wealthy Detroiters. Tucked behind their Victorian retreats were stables and working farms. Each June, children, domestic staff, and household goods were loaded into carriages and transported from Detroit mansions to Lake St. Clair cottages. During the summer months, busy executives traveled to and from their offices by private yacht. One group purchased a small steamer called Layla. The vessel left Gross Point for Detroit each morning at 8.30 and returned each afternoon at 4.30. Many summer residents made their fortunes in the railroad and related industries. James McMillan and John Newberry were partners in the manufacture of railroad cars. In 1875, the two entrepreneurs built adjacent twin chalets and called their estate Lake Terrace. By 1882, Henry Ledger, the president of the Michigan Central Railroad, was summering with his family in a nearby shingle-style bungalow called Cloverlay. The same year, William Kerr Muir, a retired railroad superintendent and art collector, moved into his new villa. He called it Atsakita, in honor of the Indian name for Lake St. Clair. By the end of the century, shipping magnate William McMillan had built an expansive colonial revival cottage overlooking the lake. He was soon followed by real estate developer Hugo Shearer. These magnificent dwellings and their occupants helped Gross Point become known as the Newport of the Midwest. Life in the colony was a kaleidoscope of parties and special events. In 1886, the vacationer's favorite gathering place was the Gross Point Club. Its turreted clubhouse, built on the site of the Fisher Hotel, had a long veranda suitable for summer socializing and spacious lawns ideal for sporting events. Because its membership remained small, the club was reorganized in 1888 and became known as the privately owned Gross Point Casino. As the summer colony grew, so did its lore. Back in the summer of 1892, 
Henry Ledger's two sons borrowed a small sailboat. The Ledger's made vividly recalls that eventful afternoon. I was shutting this cottage windows due to an unexpected storm when I suddenly saw a wave swamp the boy's sailboat. Well, I quickly ran in and rang Mrs. Ledger in Detroit and she called her husband at his office and he immediately dispatched his steam yacht to retrieve the boys. I've been told the family still chuckles about the boys' embarrassment when they reach shore and the waiting camera buffs. By the late 19th century, a national fad for photography also swept through Gross Point. According to an 1892 Detroit News article, Everyone in the happy Gross Point set has been snapped. The cyclists, the pretty girls, the lazy men who dote on the hammock and the siesta, groups on the lawn in careless attitudes, groups at the boathouses, eager fishermen, live tennis players. Life for the summer people was not entirely frivolous. T.P. Hall, a retired commodities broker, often held literary gatherings at Tonnencourt, his rambling lakeside estate. Two of Detroit's local historians, Silas Farmer and Marie Caroline Hamlin, were frequent guests of Mr. Hall's. Some cottagers were active in village affairs. One group helped to organize the area's first Protestant congregation, the Gross Point Protestant Evangelical Association. In 1867, the association built its lakeside church on property donated by villager Rufus Kirby. As the hamlet of Gross Point evolved, more farms were sold, and families moved to homes on rural lanes such as Kirby and Lakeview. Some men became gardeners or tenant farmers on summer estates. Some worked at Clairview, a Jersey stock farm and show place owned by Detroit drug manufacturer George Davis. Others learned to be shopkeepers and carpenters. Their children attended one-room schools run by fractional school districts. Students were taught to read and write in buildings like the Cook School on Mack Avenue. In 1885, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart opened a young ladies' boarding school next to St. Paul Catholic Church. A year later, the cloistered order added a free school for local Catholic children. Gross Point's population continued to grow creating a need for a more defined infrastructure. In 1879, the village of Gross Point was formed. Its boundaries stretched from Fisher Road to Provencal Road and from Lake St. Clair to Mack Avenue. Within 10 short years, the village's western boundary was extended to Cadu Road. The expansion continued as more building sites became available when Detroit developer William Moran began draining the marshy Windmill Point area. To provide lakeside estates with water, a pumping station was erected at Moross Road. And in 1893, when the summer people tried to make Lakeshore Road into a separate municipality, the residents inland were very unhappy. As a compromise, the village of Gross Point was divided in two at Fisher Road, the eastern part became the village of Gross Point Farms. Other municipal changes would soon follow. In 1894, the Protestants, now known as the Gross Point Protestant Society, moved from Kirby Road to the new little ivy-covered church adjacent to the Gross Point Casino. And in 1899, the growing Catholic population moved into a larger neo-Gothic-style church. At this time, it became imperative that residents had access to convenient public transportation linking Gross Point with Detroit. Since 1888, trolleys carried them to and from the city. And in 1891, summer residents George Henry, William Moran, and George Davis constructed a direct route along Jefferson Avenue to the station at Fisher Road. When an extension along Lakeshore was proposed, cottage owners objected. After much debate, the courts decreed that trolleys between Fisher and Provencal roads were to run behind the cottages along Gross Point Boulevard. In 1898, a new trolley line nicknamed the Interurban 
connected Detroit with Mount Clemens via Gross Point. That spring, local improvements were overshadowed by the Spanish-American War. Spurred on by Detroiter Russell Alger, who was President McKinley's Secretary of War, young men from the summer colony sailed away aboard the USS Yosemite to blockade Puerto Rico's San Juan Harbor. In August, the Spaniards surrendered, and the sailors returned home triumphant. Young officers such as Truman Newberry and Strathern Hendry quickly readjusted to civilian life. In the summer colony, social activities still centered around the newly opened Country Club of Detroit. Since April, the new club had occupied the former Gross Point Casino and grounds. Improvements included construction of an 18-hole golf course on land leased from club member Joseph Berry. Harbinger of the future, Joseph Berry and his daughters were the first and for almost 20 years the only prominent Detroiters to live year-round in Gross Point. In 1882, Detroit architects Mason and Rice designed his new home called Edgemere. Berry's estate was surrounded by expansive greenhouses and magnificent lakeside gardens. Like many late 19th century businessmen, Mr. Berry became a legend. His early experiments on his mother's stove produced the first batch of his famous hard oil finish varnish. This discovery, plus his investment in real estate, lumber, and flypaper, made millions. Other families, including the Joys, the Newberries, the Dodges, eventually followed Mr. Berry's lead and built expansive year-round estates facing Lake St. Clair. During the first few decades of the 20th century, these automotive pioneers and industrialists helped transform Gross Point from a rural village and Victorian summer resort to an elegant Detroit suburb. 